Hello, this is Anna Nistrova, and welcome to my podcast. Today, my guest is Scott Sinclair, entrepreneur, business owner, the turnaround specialist, and my fellow podcaster. We'll talk about all of that in this episode and more than that. Scott, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me, Anna. I'm very excited. And congratulations on the launch of your new podcast. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. It means a lot to me. It means a lot your support and your participation. Thank you. Well, without further ado, I'll start. I'll jump in and I'll ask you a few questions. Um, let's start with the background. Could you tell me what do you do now and what draw you to this role and what you are doing? Well, currently I am the founder, 100% owner and CEO of a company called Sinclair Range. We have offices in uh, Toronto and Calgary and New York. And what we do at Sinclair Range is we uh, really two two things. One is we advise and consult and assist other companies, mid-market and smaller, typically that are in trouble. And we help them do the turnaround and the related investment banking, which means we find the money and the restructuring uh, potentially that that company might have to go through. And what we also do, which is about a two and a half year old product line for us, or maybe three years now product line for us, is we act as principal. So we actually buy or invest in those companies and and do the turnaround and restructuring and hold those in our portfolio, much like a private equity fund might, um, but, but we're not a fund. We don't have anybody else's uh, cash and so in the portfolio. So we have Sinclair Range that does that. We own a company called Novani Stainless, which is a manufacturer of stainless steel sinks and and uh, strainers. And we sell through plumbing wholesalers, Home Depots, so do-it-yourself stores, um, that sort of thing. Uh, we own a company called Roofers World that makes tools for the roofing industry. We own a company called Equip Innovations in Quebec, which is a tier one, tier two automotive supplier where we produce uh, ceiling systems for platforms such as Aston Martin, uh, McLaren, Bell Helicopters. Uh, we run, but don't. Into so all of those companies we own 100%. Um, and I'm president of every one of those companies. I'm also president, and we have an option on Globex Extraction Services. Uh, out of Colorado, which is a hemp processing facility um, and has some, you know, CBD, non-THC products coming out of that. Um, and a couple of smaller sort of lending investment banking groups that we don't need to talk about. But that's generally how I spend my day is I'm, I'm president of those companies and try to work on all those companies. And every one of those that I mentioned was a turnaround, which means that they're they are, uh, they're, they're a handful. Most of them are going well at this point, but uh, that's been a lot. Yeah, considering how busy you are, it's so precious to have you actually, to have attention and time with you here. And I usually start my podcast with a story how I met my guest, and I want to share that as well. So we met actually in Calgary, I want to say around five years ago. And ever since then, every single time when we have an interaction, it's been just such an educational experience for me. It's a lot of fun as well, but also the stories that you shared about your businesses and how every single time I talk to you, you have a new project, new company, new turnaround project. And it's just very fascinating to hear about it. And I wanted to ask you, how did it all start like how, from the very beginning? So could you please tell me where did you grow up and how you found yourself doing all of those things. How did you find found yourself? Did you find yourself getting into business? What was your path? Well, I grew up um, outside of a small town in Ontario, Canada, by the name of Belleville, Ontario. So that as a city is maybe I don't know forty thousand people, forty five thousand people, and that's where I went to high school. But I had to take a bus an hour. To get there each way uh, because we lived out in farm country. Uh, we did not farm, but I lived out in farm country. When I went to visit my, you know, my friend, I had to cross two fields to get to their house. And so I've always been 
really a, a country boy, if that's the right word, but but more comfortable in that environment, even though I, I love big urban centers. And while I was growing up, I worked a lot with my father. He was always entrepreneurial, uh, particularly in real estate, but in other ventures as well. And so he would always, all summer, that's what I did. I didn't go to camps or anything. I went with him and we'd go to work. So I was always sort of around that. I ran construction crews when I was like 14 and uh, and uh, was exposed to the entrepreneurial life as part of it. So maybe maybe it got into my blood that way. I have no idea. I mean, on the other hand, <laughs> my, my mother um, uh, was a nurse and just had a stable job our entire mm -hmm. lives. Uh, and so, you know, that, that's really from a family dynamic, a, a pretty good offset to have, you know, the risk taker and the non risk taker. And so anyways, I grew up all around that. I don't know what my influences were, but that was sort of, sort of my, um, my upbringing. And then I, I went to university in Ottawa, at what is now the Telfer school of business university of Ottawa. And I was doing a, I did a four year degree in business, which was a marketing honors, but then I was hired by an accounting firm. And so uh, I was convinced I wanted to be an investment banker as it turned out when I finally figured it out. When I went to school and I was, uh, I was really young. I think I was 16 when I went to university. And so I didn't really have a good handle on what I was going to do or why. And um, anyways, I ended up, I was convinced that in Canada, you know, accounting is a good thing to be doing. And so I went that path and had to go back to school at night to catch up on all those accounting courses that I missed. And I ended up at what would be called now KPMG. Um, it wasn't at the time, it was a, a predecessor firm, but I was at KPMG and I ended up in Toronto and I ended up ultimately in their corporate finance valuation group, which is, you know, private corporate finance slash investment banking for private companies. Um, and then I, in the course of being in that group at KPMG, I hit basically because just because of the timing of my career, I think I started there in 90, 1990 in that group. Maybe it was 91, but I hit every bankrupt company there was of any size in Canada. We were on um, Algoma, Steel, Olympia, York, Imperial Optical, uh, Lendorf, Bramley, um, Magna. Did we do Magna? I think we did Magna at one point. And so, you know, just these these large Canadian companies that were bankrupt. And, and I wasn't doing the bankruptcy side of this. We were doing the sales side of it. So the investment banking divestiture part of that and you just get a, a taste for being in that, what we used to call the gray market. And what's so interesting and exciting about that for someone like me is this exact same skill set as M&A work, um, investment banking work, but it's on hyperspeed. Because if you don't do it this week, if you're not done, there's nothing left mm -hmm. in this company. That's the nature of being bankrupt. So I, I um, that's, that's what I learned in... Um, 94, I left and started a, a private corporate finance house that I owned. That was my first entrepreneurial venture. I went back to Ottawa, Canada to do that, uh, called Merchant Capital. And we grew and we did a ton of, a ton of corporate finance business. And I stopped that in 2005 when I turned 40 and took a couple of years off and then restarted what is now Sinclair Range. Again, predecessor firms, but ultimately in a similar mm -hmm. range. So that's, that's been the journey. Yeah. But what do you think was the main reason why you decided to do it on your own? Because I think not everyone would do it. I would imagine many people go to work for companies like KPMG and they would probably stay there or move from one company to another and move along the ladder, climb the ladder. But what was your motivation to start your own venture? You're going to be so disappointed in my answer. And I, and I get I get asked this a lot, as you can imagine, on these sorts of podcasts. And um, you would think I would have a better answer at this point, um, having thought about it. But the honest truth is, I've always been someone who has had a general direction that they want to go in their career, a general direction in life. 
a general direction in businesses. Every one of these businesses that I discuss, I want to sort of head that way. But I've really never been hung up on the specifics of that. I just know I want to go that way. And I try to take opportunities that come to me as they come to me. I was awesome and happy. I don't mean performance awesome, although I think I was doing pretty well. But I was just content. That's the word I'm looking for at KPMG in 1994. And a guy that I knew, a friend of mine, called me and they had launched a corporate finance uh, shop in Ottawa and they really wanted my help and it looked like a great opportunity. And so I said, okay, because my leaning is always to say yes, right? And not to get stressed about, do I want to be an entrepreneur or do I want to be <laughs> at the accounting firm? And then, and so I moved, I moved my uh, fiance and we all went to Ottawa and my dogs and we all went to Ottawa and, um, Six months later, I quit that firm because I didn't like it at all. And now I'm in Ottawa with my fiance and my dogs. And so I thought, well, I could do this myself. So I just started. I had to, uh, it'll make you laugh. Uh, I had to borrow $5,000 for my wife to be to buy a printer. That was my major issue when we started that company. But uh, it worked out okay. Yeah. Did you charge any interest? I, I, did she charge I, I, any interest on the? <laughs> Oh, that's that's but it's a great story because that's the start. And I think many people have maybe unrealistic or some sort of a fairy tale type of uh notion of how people start their businesses. So I'm trying to I think give people, people real stories. People real have, stories um paralysis from fear and overthink. Yeah. That's what they have. And uh, I agree. You want to experience different things in life, if you want to affect change, which is the essence of a turnaround doesn't matter if it's in your life or a business, you have to try different things. Like, how can you expect to change and improve if you don't try different things? And if it doesn't work, go somewhere else, right? Try something new. But you have to, you know, I get questions all the time on my podcast, um, in my client base, where, you know, I, I can't, something that you might be used to. So, so a younger person in their career is looking for the, the perfect job. Right. And they're like, can I find a company that aligns with my values? How are you ever going to objectively answer that question? That's that's just you're just never going to know. Yeah. You can't possibly answer it. The only thing you can do is think you're going to try this or not try this. That That's the yeah. best that you can do. And if it doesn't work, try something else. And so I've always just innately felt that way. I've I've uh, I was an athlete. Um, so not a particularly great athlete, but I was an athlete. And so, you know, I've always had a bit of a aggression and risk taking attitude because of that. So, um, you know, I didn't have anything to fall back on. So it was sink or swim, but that, that's the way I think about it. Yeah. yeah. I actually was listening to something along this line just recently about trying new things. And we are fired by fear as just human beings, right? We are stopped by fear, fear of new things. So the suggestion was to go and try new, like little things, small things, make changes, small changes in your life, going to the same restaurant, but ordering a completely different dish, going to the same place, but taking a different road. I actually do it once in a while for myself too. I try to actually, if I'm going to the same place, I'm driving to the same place. I consciously make a decision to take a different road without using GPS, just me trying to figure out the way. It's just my little small things that I do for myself. So I don't get... A custom. It's Pardon a me? mental hack on that particular issue, right? Yeah. When, when yes. you're in the turnaround business, you're dealing with troubled companies. I have a, a company that comes to me. They're overwhelmed. They're stressed. They have really, they have paralysis by fear and they don't know where they're trying to go. I, I always try to describe it as you're, you're just, you just want to get home and you're stuck in the middle of the woods and you don't know what direction to even go. Right. Never mind the whole brute home. You don't even know if you should be going this way or this way. Or I don't know if you've ever had mm -hmm. that feeling, but I have. And so you, you just got to pick something and go with it. And we, I think, as humans build up tolerance levels. And when you're the turnaround business where I started this, you do this every day. You face this anxiety every day. And then suddenly it's not really anxiety. Right. It. 
you build up this tolerance for it. But if you don't have that tolerance, you can't go from zero to 100 all at once. You need to yeah. take that first step and do little things differently to, you know, to, to build up your capability to process stress and to face your fears. Yeah, I, I agree. But I think that's what usually people have, especially when you think about starting a new business or new career or jump from one place to another. So it's definitely fear, but it's like you said, you can fight it quite easily by making small changes at first and then making big changes and building the tolerance. And I what think, about, yeah, what about you? And uh, oh. I think that you need to, you know, the fear related to starting a business. Well, you should be terrified. <laughs> you, you should not feel like that's okay. The, the whole reason I do my podcast is to try to improve the stats on business failure. You know, 90% of businesses never, ever, ever, ever pay their founder a living wage. 90%, right? And, and only 2% ever create intergeneration, intergenerational wealth. In other words, 98%, maybe a little bit of them pay you, you know, you can pay your mortgage and eat. But you're not selling the business and becoming rich and famous and path it, passing wealth onto your kids. That's not happening. 2% of the time that happens. And so you should be terrified of those stats. You should be fearful. The trick is to be mindful of that and to use it as motivation to execute. <laughs> Well, then the question is, why would you even try? Why people still go and do it? Why those 98% still get up and try? Well, people right? have if you their think own that reasons way. for that. Um, and, you know, and, and the obvious answer is people are going to say money, but I don't think that's it at all. I think it's freedom. Um, and you as an entrepreneur would confirm to me, I think you have on episodes that we've done on my podcast, is that. Yeah, I think you're going to be free, but what you're free to do is to work 24-7, 365. Yes. That's what you're free to do. But it's your choice. It's your vision. It's your creativity. And it's your fault if you succeed. And it's your fault if you fail. If you don't. Right? <laughs> and so that's part of the driver of it. And my, my big fear, Anna, um, in today's society is that we sell kids on social media. When I say kids, I mean young adults. Uh, we sell young adults on social media to become entrepreneurs, to, mm -hmm. to leave the corporate world. And the stats are the stats. 90% of them are gonna fail because they, don't, they just don't know, or they're not meant to be a leader. Not everybody's meant to be in that position. But what would you change then? Because I do know what you say, and I agree with you partially, because when I see those shiny, let's call them shiny ads or shiny pictures, videos of people living great life as an entrepreneur, I think they're, they're more glamorous than they are. So what would you change in that case? Because I still think we need to encourage people. I think it's important to tell people, and that's partially what we are doing right now here, saying that if you have that idea, you should go and try it. It's better to try it than not because otherwise you will regret it. If that's the passion of yours or this burning feeling inside of you that you want to go and do something on your own. So partially the, the idea behind my podcast is just to motivate people and show them that people can change careers, can change paths and you can do whatever you are, which is all great. You're planning, dreaming to do another way and mm -hmm. forward. Um, I think what we can do is what you do and what I try to do, which is to provide some skills and to explain the risk. Yeah. Right. Risk management. Yeah. <laughs> risk tolerance, risk management. Yeah. But if you don't, if you don't, if you don't know what you're doing, if you haven't, it's hard enough if you know what you're doing. Right. And if you don't know what you're doing and you're not, if you don't have access to learning tools like this, then, then you're really in trouble. And so I think what they pitch on social media is the glossy, oh, look at me, I got a jet, right? Whereas that's not what the life is at all. It's hard, yeah. it's scary, it's stressful, and that's okay. And that's really what you're saying. You're saying that's okay. But I think what we can do as a community 
is to try to help people to understand that that's okay and to provide the skills to cope and to make better decisions and to to make sure that people know that this is all in you can't be you can't be a successful entrepreneur 8 hours a day 40 hours a week that that doesn't work yeah and what type of skills you would say you wish you learned earlier in your career that help you now something that people can maybe focus on because i think that's important too to know your strengths and weaknesses and some skills that you're maybe lacking in the process do you have a maybe one skill or couple that you can mention that you wish you knew or learned earlier than i don't know than now or like what do you have right now so you wish you worked on it when you were 20s for example i don't know that i wish i worked on it in my 20s um but i was always an obvious person i was always in finance um, with accounting background on that, but always in finance, business valuation, building financial models, managing a business and leading a business through the numbers. And the older I get, the less I do of that. And the more HR people connection side I find. So the, the bigger, the bigger my entity gets, the more of an HR job it becomes, I find. Okay. And, um, so much so that I think has become a problem in 2022. Like I've lost touch on the number side. So my goal in 23 is to head back the other way a little bit. But you, um, and, and the other thing that I I think I'm not great at is brand building and sales. Um, but then the results would speak otherwise. But I just personally feel <laughs> like I'm not all that strong at that. And so I think the message there is that. As you go through your career, as you build your business, the demands from you change over time. What you feel is important changes over time, depending on your circumstance and just where you're at. But for me, I was always super strong at the numbers and I was not very good or frankly, and even caring about the human side of it. And I think I've changed a lot mm -hmm. on that. Yeah. And I also think the change of role in business that we see when AI can take over some number side and we have so many automated, I don't know, platforms nowadays that can help accountants, financial advisors, traders, etc., to deal with numbers, but there's still a niche in the need for people to have those people skills. So I think it's, it's going to be something that will be needed for quite some time. I think, I believe so. I hope so. <laughs> Otherwise, we will lose <laughs> the human connection forever. So I hope so. It would be um, a skill that will be highly valued in the future. And I also think people need to know about that and develop, obviously, those skills. I would argue that if leaders, uh, salespeople, business development people, really anybody that has an element of forward-facing to their role, their value to the world in general will just skyrocket if they're willing to leave their house and go have a cup of coffee or a glass of water <laughs> with somebody else or to sit in their office. There is so much resistance to that. I think to me, the pendulum has gone way too far the other way and it just has to come back because, uh, you know, business doesn't work that way. Business works mm -hmm. with a, with a personal connection, which so you and I can do this over whatever this app is right now that we're talking on, right? So we could have a, a FaceTime call or Zoom and we have a connection. But we have a connection because we met in Calgary before. Before, and we've, yes. We've hung out, you know, six, seven times in our lives and had discussions mm -hmm. over a glass of wine. And so we have that connection. And if we hadn't done that work first, this energy wouldn't exist. I agree. Yeah. I agree. And you touched on something I'm extremely passionate about overall, the sales, the notion of sales and business development roles to how people get scared of those or they don't understand the f true value of those, especially people who want to run businesses and want to succeed in their careers. They have to work on those skills no matter where they come from, no matter what their background is, educational, work-wise. So you literally touched on what I try to convey to people and the message that I'm trying to send through my work, through the educational platforms that I've been yeah. working on. That's something I'm trying to send to this world that I discovered for myself 
through circumstances I went through, but it's so important to build those skills because they will be transferable from for, for so many different areas in work and life. So well, I think what you touched on is very yeah, important. I mean, you personally are the poster child of someone who just threw their self, threw themselves into different situations and <laughs> figured it out. And there's an element of everything in that, but sales in particular. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I have another question for you in terms of uh, international experiences in anything you can share with me from your work experience when maybe you had the chance to deal with a company or a person from a different country and you had to negotiate any type of deal and you faced some differences, cultural differences, and if you were able to overcome them. Do you have any examples or any stories you could share with me? Sure. Uh, I've, they tell me, I, I've lost count, but they tell me that we've worked, I've worked in 27 different countries and just 27. that would include North America, <laughs> the islands, Europe, and a little bit of Eastern Europe and North Africa, but never Asia or you know, what I would call, I, I guess, I don't know what you would call. I've been to Egypt and that Africa, but nowhere else is what I'm trying to say. So, um, mm -hmm. so I do have quite a bit of experience. In the UK. So I, I do have quite a bit of experience internationally. And all of that is on doing deals, um, whether that be financings, um, mergers, acquisitions, restructurings, um, or just structurings. How do you, how do you structure um, a fund. For example, um, we were once engaged to migrate a company from Ireland to a Luxembourg CCAF fund structure. This was a long time ago in the 90s that had, I, I don't remember, like a $10 billion valuation. And so, so we had to do, I had to do that work. I've set up funds in Switzerland. Um, I've owned and managed funds out of the Bahamas and I've done restructurings, you know, everywhere because, you know, it's not like somebody, for example, hires me in Denmark to go restructure their company. But if you are restructuring, trying to turn around a Canadian company or a U.S. company of any size, well, they have subsidiaries in many different places and you, you actually have to go do it in those places as well. And so, yeah, examples um, that sort of relate to negotiation. Um, I'll, I'll tell you the one thing I've learned. There's a bunch of things mm -hmm. I've, I've learned working internationally in a different cultures and different languages is that the immediate thing you need to do is go hire the very best professionals that you can find, lawyer and accountant, um, in that in the country, in that country where you are doing a business, right? Yeah, I don't care what mm -hmm. you're doing. Like you just need to walk in to the very best high-end lawyer that you can find and you need to pay them what you need to pay them. And you need to ride on their coattails because you don't stand a chance otherwise. So for example, um, I had a company whose name I won't mention that I was turning around and restructuring and they were a North American company. Their European distribution was out of Denmark. And they hadn't filed any of their accounting governmental annual filings that you have to do in that particular jurisdiction. I'm going to get my facts a little bit wrong because it was a long time ago. And so I don't remember the exact details. But what happens in that jurisdiction is the, or at least at the time, is the government, if you, if you fail, you know, like you get a couple of chances to cure that problem. But if you don't, the government basically shuts down your company and winds it up, which means they appoint a trustee to sell your assets and you're gone, including your, your assets, <laughs> which is all your inventory because it's a distribution center. And when I started, that was going to happen in 45 days. That was, and, mm -hmm. and we didn't have a hope in hell of doing the accounting and getting the financial information together um, to satisfy the government in that period of time in the way that the forms 
needed to be filled out because it's just a bureaucratic form filling thing. And so I just wandered into Copenhagen where I'd never been before. <laughs> and uh, I found uh, the most awesome lawyer that I can possibly remember. His name is uh, Klaus. I don't remember his last name off the top of my head. I remember his <laughs> office specifically. It was stunning just on the, I don't know if that's a bay there or an inlet or whatever it is. And, um, and I got him and then he recommended an accounting firm, a boutique accounting firm. And, and, and no one in the history of Denmark had gotten off that list ever. And so we were doomed. We were doomed, except we won. We won that. So, wow. you know, because if you know your business well enough and you know the concepts, and again, this general, I want to head in this direction. And, and in fairness, this was an accounting issue. And I used to be an accountant. I'm still an accountant, but I used to you know, do that every day. I was able to say, no, we can't do that. But we could do this, this, and the other thing relatively easily. Like by next week, I can get you that information. And then you get your lawyer, the high price fellow or gal, but this was a fellow, to go and negotiate that and give them all the support you need. And we, we won. And, and I don't know what's gone on since, but we were literally the only company in the history of Denmark to save ourselves from that doom at the time. And, um, yeah. you know, everywhere that I've been in these 27 different countries trying to negotiate and get transactions done, for me, step number one is to get the right professionals on site. But question on that front, so when you're looking for that right professional, do you still need to meet with them and have a feeling that it's the right person? Because I would imagine it's not only about being the most expensive lawyer or the most expensive accounting firm. You also talk about specific person. You need to like that person or you need to not specifically like, maybe like is the wrong term, but to feel that you have a connection and understanding around the goal. What would you say about that? Because to me, that's not only the list of the best people, but sometimes even the best listed company, if you go and talk to them, sometimes you, you might not feel that it's well, the right decision. What, well, how do you make those, that, those type of decisions? That way because maybe they are the best at their speciality, but maybe their speciality doesn't fit with what you're trying to do. So that doesn't help you, right? So you don't even have to think negatively about this. You can give them all the benefit of the doubt, uh, doubt as a professional, but it, they have to fit with what you're trying to accomplish. And I think the answer to your question is um, in person or by, by Zoom. Like I, I don't think that matters so much right now in today's mm -hmm. age. Back then, we had to be in person, obviously. But you need to find the person that you can sit down and say, here is my problem. Here's what I think about it. Here's what I think we can deliver. How might you be able to help me? And what I have zero tolerance for is the professionals that push back and say, here's all your risks and why this is going to go bad. Right. That's, <laughs> that's not good. And, and that's mm -hmm. what many professionals I'm one of, I'm, you know, I am a professional. So I understand that community. Many of them, that's what they feel their job is, is they're not the entrepreneur. They're not the leader. They're not the business owner. They're there to cover your rear end with being risks. focused on the negatives. But, I already know I'm on the list to be <laughs> wound up and have my inventory sold. And I already know that no one's ever gotten what I need is solutions and a plan. And I need to understand the risk and my probability of success. Right. Right. It, we have a 50% chance of success. I think I can sell this. I can't sell that. Okay. Well, I can now make that decision. I mean, that's, and, 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 you know, you call around for some references and this and that. Oh, yeah, it's a close guy. He's a wonderful guy. Um, and, you know, he's a great lawyer. I and mean, that's the best that you can do. It's a personal feeling um, at the end yeah. of the day. But in, in a Canadian context or a U.S. context, do you want to hire uh, a family law lawyer at the top of their field to help you with your, with your acquisition? of a different company like it just doesn't make any sense and you need to mm -hmm. that sounds so dead simple as you say it but when you get into foreign jurisdictions you know nothing about um, you have to be aware of those things yeah so i would say to summarize it like to do to uh, have a proper due diligence and also to 
have to take that time to sit down and discuss and make sure that that person or the firm you're talking to or the representative of that firm has a potential solution for you, not just all the risks covered. So that would be your, let's say, two main things. Am I getting yeah. it right? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I might be a different client than most clients because rarely do I go to, a, in fact, never do I go to a lawyer and say, here's my problem. What do you think? I, I, because I've done my work for 30 years in different countries. So I 100% of the time go to a lawyer and I say, here's the situation. Here's what I want to do about it. Can you do that? Right, which is a whole different. Yes. And, and every lawyer that I've ever dealt with has said, well, you're just really different than all of our other clients because you're always telling us what to do instead of mm -hmm. around. So, you know, maybe Anna, I'm not even the best person to answer this question, but I think if you know, <laughs> if you know your business and what you're trying to accomplish and you're hyper clear and simple and not nuanced, uh, which means that you're clear and simple about your objectives, it just makes aligning with your professional much easier. Yeah, I like that to be clear and simple. I like that because it makes it simpler for everyone to kind of follow those objectives. So, so how do you compare yourself to other turnaround specialists then, or do you ever even compare yourself to to other turnaround specialists? I never do. Um, I never have. And I also, in all the businesses that I've owned over the years or worked for over the years, which is hundreds. I've never once done a competitive analysis or compared ourselves to a competitor. What I really believe in is focusing on cu uh, customers instead, on clients instead, being customer centric, and always seeking to add more value every day to those customers to provide a better, more seamless experience to be more responsive and and if I do that, I don't have to worry about my competitors. I just need to do the best that we can and do better every day. I think the only person you should compare yourself to is you from yesterday and make sure that you're continuously improving and embracing change, not resting on your laurels, which is, you know, a huge problem of entrepreneurs that have had any sort of success, right? They, 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 they're part of the 10% that break through this, this, you know, getting a paycheck out of their business. And then they just start to coast like, Oh, I can't believe I did that. Thank good, Thank goodness. And then it all just starts to go downhill because they haven't been paying attention mm -hmm. for five years. And so constant improvement. And, and if I am looking to the, competitors at all it's because i'm losing and i want to understand what they're doing better not to copy them but to maybe shortcut our experience of getting from here to there okay and do you think i i like that idea actually because i do believe that what you can do for yourself is to compare yourself to yourself like you said in your constant improvement so i think i live by the same rule but sometimes I think healthy competition can be a good thing, but the problem uh, and, and the question I wanted to raise here, what is a healthy competition? Where's that line that draws when you are getting positives from looking at your competitors or even comparing yourself for that matter with someone or your business to something similar versus when you cross that line. And like you said, and then it starts to be more draining. It drains the energy, it drains the resources. So where do you think that lies? Well, I, I think this, I think there was a commingling of a few concepts in that question. This idea of healthy competition, I don't think that does anything for me. I think that's absolutely necessary for the end user, for the customer, for the client, right? Because you have different people or entities competing to provide more value to that end user. And you know, our entire system doesn't work unless you have that. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it makes any difference to my business. I think every business should look to improve every day to add more value to their customer, but you know, almost to 
try to come up with a plan that would be monopolistic in nature. Like, how do I just not even worry about that competition? How do I dominate this market? How do I add so much value to this customer that it's a no-brainer that they ought to be using me? I mean, that should be the goal, shouldn't it, of everybody, right? Should should you, Anna, be embracing uh, potential students looking for medical sales to go be educated somewhere else in the name of healthy competition? No, you shouldn't be doing that. You should be the no-brainer choice of, yeah. of that particular market, right? Now, if there is a competitor and that competitor forces you to be better, then great for the student. That's the way I think about it. Yeah. Okay. Well, I like that. What about your new venture? Well, it's not that new anymore. Your podcast, the Winning Momentum podcast, and I'll share uh, all the details in the description of this podcast myself so people can go and listen to it if they haven't and watch you on YouTube as well. So I'm just wondering how is it going? And is it a new thing for you? Because obviously you started it after such a successful career in business world, you decided to go and share your knowledge and share your wisdom with the world. And you became the speaker as well. And you started putting out that, that content online. I wonder how it's going for you and what type of lessons you've learned since you've started it. I think to answer that question, I need to maybe go way back to pre-podcasts. And I told you that in 94, I started my first entrepreneurial venture, my first corporate finance house under the brand Merchant Capital in Ottawa. And we did a lot of advisory corporate finance deals, like a lot. We did probably 80 and two, two and a half years of venture capital tech deals and in the Ottawa community, really small numbers, but um, but we were super active back then, dominated the market, and and I was just a guy in a business center office, well, first in my house, but in my apartment, but then in a business center office, and there was real names, uh, corporate names that I would have to compete against, and so so. To me, and this is true to this day, if you're not a big corporate brand, if you're a small fish, what you need to do is you need to get attention and you need to build trust. <laughs> okay. So my my acronym for my methodology to negotiate or persuade, which is basically the same thing, is ATMOG, attention, trust, um, the meaning uh, openness and gap. Okay. And so we don't, we could go into that if you wanted to, we don't need to, but the first two pieces of that are attention. If they've never heard of you, then, then you're not going to succeed and trust. If they don't believe that you're credible, that you're experienced, that you're someone that they can trust, then you're sunk. Always. Okay. And the way the big firms deal with that is through the power of the brand and through, and just through their horsepower. So if we're looking at a company that's in, a company that's in trouble, do they come to Sinclair range? Do they come to Scott Sinclair or do they go to Ernst and Young, right? The world's largest accounting firm or close to it with a great brand. Now we, we do entirely different things. I don't do what Ernst Young does. Ernst Young doesn't do what I do, certainly in this market. Um, it's entirely different, but the customer doesn't really know that. They just see, they don't understand the nuance of that and the different approaches, right? What they do know, they go to Ernst and Young and they see the big fancy office and they feel, they feel comfortable. And they come to me back in those days and I meet them at Starbucks, you know, for a coffee, it's not the same experience, right? And so what I started doing was I, I did ads in a newspaper and the ads in the newspaper in Ottawa, they have, I think it was called Silicon Valley North. And so, and again, I'm, I'm trying to think back to the mid nineties here. And it was um, a, a, a free journal and it was once a month. So there was 12 issues during a year. 
And I learned the power of committing to 12 ads versus trying to buy one. It's way cheaper. Um, and so I created what was called a financial tombstone. And anybody who's in the financial business would know what that is. If you're not, it's sort of a rectangular ad. And it would announce, you know, XYZ company bought ABC company and Merchant Capital or Sinclair Range was the advisor on that. That's what a tombstone is. You look in the Wall Street Journal, you look in the Financial Post, you're going to see still to this day, every now and then, a tombstone. And so I created those, but I put a, um, a big, bold header on it, which said results, not promises. And then we would announce a deal. And I ran them every single issue. We were doing enough deals that we always had new content. And I did that for a couple of years. And then people would say to me, I promise you I'm getting to podcasts. People would say to me, you know, did anybody ever phone you from those ads? And I would say, no, but I didn't expect anybody ever to phone me from those ads. But I can't tell you how many times I was introduced to the CEO of a tech company that needed help or cash and who often we were cold calling, but I'd, I'd go in for a meeting and the CEO would open the desk drawer and cut everyone, bring every one of those ads had been cut out of the newspaper and put them on the desk. So they were like, you're that guy, right? And attention and trust, it built credibility and it turned what would have been a six to nine month sales cycle of begging, like, I'm serious, I could do this. You just, <laughs> you know, we could work together. It would take that and turn it into instant, into instant. And so that's where I learned that. And when blogging started later, as we head into 2000s, I stopped doing those ads and I started writing blog posts. And I turned our whole website, whatever company it was at the time, into, into a blog as opposed to a static website. And, and every sync, just like, just like the tombstone ads, no one ever called me, but every single person I met would quote to me from something I wrote on a blog. Every new person would say, hey, I saw that article on shareholder loans you, you posted on this blog that you do. That's really cool. And I really agree with that point, right? Attention and trust. And when we were, were at Merchant Capital Days and we were, say, those days, I don't know, 10, 12 bankers, like a small shop in Toronto, that website was getting 6,000 views a month. And I, you know, like back to those days, and I promise you, well, I know for a fact what some of the large accounting firms were getting, and it was nowhere close to that. We once, I once did a post on uh, a US bank, PNC, and you know, like, PNC said this, and here's some thoughts on that. And there was a link to PNC to their article. And I, about three weeks later, got a call from the head of PNC in Toronto saying that he got a call from his tech people wondering who the hell these merchant capital people were because they're number one users on the website globally because it was all, sorry, it was all feeding through those links, right? And so attention and trust. And so, you know, as technology marches on, that's what a podcast is to me. And so I was, you know, I travel all the time. I have my headphones in nonstop. I'm listening. I used to listen to three, four audio books a week. And then I switched to podcasts and I really enjoyed them. And you learn a lot. And I thought to myself, well, that's the new blogging, right? And so we thought on a lark, well, we'll, we'll check this out. What's the worst that can happen? And so we started uh, merging, what was it called? Uh, Martinis with Scott. And the yeah. idea was, I think you were on Martinis with Scott once or twice. And the idea was, Originally, it would be a live stream from my office in Toronto once a week, and um, I had some martinis, and we had some guests, and maybe business owners or leaders would enjoy that sort of discussion. And then we just got crushed by the technology of trying to do a live stream. And so it turned into a recorded, uh, and we did that for a couple of years, and the exact same result. You know, what if hundred people listen to it, to that video. Like it's nobody in the grand scheme of things. And often that would be the case, but a hundred people listen to it. They got value out of it, which I like, cause I'm trying to find ways to add value to the market in general. But 
Every single person that I met as a new prospect had listened to a video, talked to me about it, just like they did with the blog posts, just like they did with the Tombstone ads. And the third benefit that had never even occurred to me was that the guest that I had on was a connection for life. And that was way more true when it was live. Um, but it's still true. It's still true. When you go through this experience with somebody who, by definition, is related to your industry in some way, right, or to your life in some way, you've, you've built this connection. So there's there's all sorts of benefits. Um, so the Martinez with Scott got rebranded, I think, last year to the Winning Momentum podcast. But we've just carried on with the episode numbers. And I had hired a, a big deal personal branding firm out of Nashville, and they were against the whole martini concept. And so we ended up with the Winning Momentum podcast. What I hear in this story is that consistency that I admire in you, because we spoke about it actually on your podcast when I was a guest on your podcast. And we were talking about consistency, that you stick to your plan and you don't give up. And I remember you were sharing that, that you would never give up. That's just who you are. And to me, this shows that quality. And it's so important because you just keep doing it without that great expectation, which I think that's another thing that people sometimes have right from the beginning when they start something, they expect everything to line up right away, but it doesn't. And then they give up. Yeah. But to have that consistency and you show it throughout so many years in different formats and also the ability to change according to the technology, according to the demand of the audience. And I love that concept that even hundred people are listening to it. Those are your people. That's your audience. It doesn't have to be 100,000. It can be 10, I don't know, it can be 10, 100, 1,000 people, but those people are your audience and they are getting value from what you do. So I, I love that. I think it's very valuable to just know and hear it. Even for me as a podcaster, I'm starting. It's a new thing for me, even though it kind of built up on what I've, I've done before, but still a new thing for me and for everyone else who's listening. So I think it's, that's crucial to know. Thank you for that. I, I would... I would maybe nuance that a little bit. I, I, I was kind of trying to talk because I, I think I once did an episode on the podcast that I titled Just Quit or <laughs> It's Time to Quit, <laughs> something like that. And <laughs> I, you know, a pet peeve of mine is people that just keep, and you see this, it's because I work in troubled businesses. And so by definition, they haven't found the answer. And what they do is they, continue to do the same thing over and over and over again and expect different results, right? And worse than that, most of these uh, business leaders are convinced that other things won't work. And you know that for a fact because they're not doing the other things, They're not, <laughs> right? They're still doing the thing they were doing before. They haven't quit the old habits and changed the new habits. So I think you need to do both. And I think you need to, you need to, I talked as a common theme throughout that about attention and trust slash credibility. You need to find a way to get that for yourself in my particular situation in many others particular situation, if you're going to persuade and if you're going to negotiate. And so what is the best way to do that? But I've changed with the technology, right? And I and I've changed right from uh, ads to blogs to podcasts to a rebranded podcast, from a video focus to a video and audio focus. Like I have quit. I've changed over and over and over again. And yeah. so, so I I think that's a nuance of that that people don't focus on enough. Like it's just, oh, perseverance and not quitting is the answer to everything. But, you know, for every successful business woman or man who succeeded because they stuck it out, there's like a billion that didn't make it and and just sort of drove off the cliff doing the same thing over and over again without adapting, without embracing change. And the first rule, I think, to to business when you need to turn it around is to affect change. You need to embrace change. What you're doing isn't yeah. right. Yeah. But go, which goes back to what we were discussing before previously, like the fear of change is the most uh, common thing that people experience. And that's why you need to accustom yourself to 
have a change in your life from small or large, but you need to build that tolerance and be okay with a change. If it doesn't work this way, you can still can make an adjustment and move ahead and make an adjustment, move ahead. So that's what I mean, because I think to me, what your story truly represents that persistence and yet adaptability right. to the new technology, to the de demand of your audience, to what works better, and also to listen to, listen to other people and other professional advice when you were told that maybe martini is not something that you want to keep in the title of your podcast. To me, those are small things, but they matter. And if you are willing to listen, despite of your, your feeling that you know what you want to do, but you listen and you take it on board and change it. To me, that's the biggest strength that one can have. I, I, yeah. um, I agree with you. I, I think the one thing you see when you walk into troubled companies is exactly what you just said, a, a resistance to change. All right. And, and I don't know that it's fear. Maybe that's the right word for it. I'm not sure. But to me, like most things in life, it boils down to a confirmation bias. And, and mm -hmm. confirmation bias is the way the human brain works. It's not a fault. It's just reality. What we do as humans is we make a decision or we have a point of view and then we seek facts to support that. And we literally have information blindness to facts that contradict the opinion or the decision that we make, right? And that's not a flaw. That's a feature in humans because the reality is there's so many data points available in the universe. What are we supposed to do? Evaluate every one of those data points and then make our decision? That's not going to happen. You couldn't drive down the road or walk across, you know, walk down the sidewalk. That's not the way we're built to operate. And to make sure that we continue to operate that way, we get cognitive dissonance, which is if we're faced with a fact that is contrary to what we believe to be true, our frame of reference on the world or the tasks that we're doing, cognitive dissonance is a severely agitating state and stressful state for a human. And so how does that apply to all this? Well, you see it in leadership teams all the time. And if you just boil it down to a mid-market trouble company with uh, some guy who's the CEO, founder, owner, manager of that business, his confirmation bias is that he used to be a success and he's at least average, probably better, but at least average in common sense, leadership and business skills. That's the confirmation bias. Yet... The evidence is he's losing money and going bankrupt, right? And why is he resistant to change? Because his bias is that he does everything the way it needs to be done in his particular business and in his industry and everybody else is wrong. That's his bias in that. And I just see that all the time. So maybe it's a fear. Maybe that's a symptom of a fear of cognitive dissonance or something like that, but it's um, to me, that's the language that I use. And the remedy to that is to know your, your metrics, to know the four or five financial objective metrics that drive your entire business, because it always, always boils down to three, four, five key metrics. Know what they are, have a benchmark, you know, like my margins have to be X to make money, right? My overhead can't be more than that to make money. I have to collect my receivables in 45 days on average, to not go bankrupt, right? Know your metrics, and when they go sideways, you're doing something wrong. You need to change, right? And, and as you said, to surround yourself with people that are willing to talk to you and are willing to say, hey, I think you're wrong on this. Try something different. Yeah, I think that's very important to have those people as well because also many people just keep saying, yes, you're right, you're right to confirm that idea and then of course you can find yourself in trouble actually over here i would like to ask you in your opinion on trending massively trending news about twitter and elon taking over and actually turning around the company making drastic changes in the company and every day i see new t news 
I don't actually read them anymore because I feel like I was overwhelmed initially. So I'm curious to know, what do you think about his approach of taking over the company of that size, of that importance in the, in the modern society? And what do you think about the job that he's doing? You know, I, I did an episode on this uh, okay. a few episodes ago because what I love about without judging, you know, good or bad, what I loved about the process is basically he was turning around a company by tweet in the open for all of us to follow along. Whether you like it or not, you could follow along and make your own decision. Who's ever done that before? Like that, <laughs> that's just, uh, to me, it was a really cool thing. Um, I think to answer your question, we need to talk about the business turnaround and not the political societal side of this so that we don't get your brand new podcast shadow banned on whatever platforms <laughs> you're releasing. <laughs> so I don't want to comment on that at all. Um, yeah. um, let's just, I think it's really important in society, but I don't want to comment on the job that he's doing, uh, which nobody should read to mean that they, I think he's doing great or think he's doing terrible. Um, but the business side of this, yeah. I think, has been fascinating. And because I was doing a, an episode on this, I actually dug in a little bit into Twitter's financials when they were public before he bought it. And okay, really quite shocking. So we're uh, I'm able to draw lessons and comparisons to my content from what I see him doing. And so number one is to to turn around a business, you need to affect change. But what is that direction? Remember, I talked to you about my life, my businesses. I want to, I want to head over here. You're in that loss in the woods. Like, let's try this way. Maybe that's where the parking lot is. Like, you have to, you have to have a direction. Well, what is that direction? Well, that direction is values. Simple, clear, everybody understands. When I, when I took over this bankrupt automotive company in Quebec, we set four values. They were teamwork which was completely the opposite of the people that used to own the business, which was a very, you know, dividing people into camps and no ownership, not, not literal ownership, but, but embracing a, an ownership thought process within the company. So teamwork, um, openness, which really boils down into integrity and honesty. We just, you know, we're not telling lies like the last people used to do. Perfect quality and perfect delivery. Not because we would ever, that's not a budget. We're not budgeting to be perfect. It's that's the direction we want to go. And every decision we make is based on those values. Are we operating as a team? Are we being open, honest, acting with integrity? Is this going to help our quality? And is it going to help our delivery times? Right? Because that's the change that we need to affect. So there's the direction. And if you look at what um, Elon has done with Twitter in the early days, and he would tweak this out for you, you can, he didn't say, here's my values, but you can, you can definitely read into that. One of them was um, to add values to advertisers, which is his main revenue source. And to do that, yeah. he said, I'm going to defeat the bots and I'm going to be more inclusive and bring more people to the platform, right? That was a value defeating bots being more inclusive, okay, for a business, mm -hmm. not for societal reason, although that's a side benefit, right? So there was one value. Another one is he said, we will be an engineering focused company. We're going to spend less yeah. time on non-engineering functions, right? Um, he said as a value that he was going to open source ideas to improve the platform. So you just see him all the time. If you look at his Twitter feed, he's tweeting out, ideas for people to think about he's receiving tweets people saying hey could you fix the feedback and then he replies he goes yeah I, I agree we'll do that and then he does it right he's he's gone to his customers and he said how can i add more value to you and then he executes on it so that's clearly a value clearly a value he's talked about is that sort of lean mean work ethic right we're not going to mm -hmm. be a bloated, pampered sort of company, and yeah. we're going to cut back to the bone. And another value he clearly says is we're not going to be boring. 
which is a <laughs> nothing boring about him. So he has set his values. And I think maybe there's a whole bunch of other values. I'm not inside his head. I can't mind read, but those are the ones that I clearly see when I just did a, yeah. you know, a few weeks ago, a flip through his Twitter feed. Another lesson that I think we could take from him in the turnaround is um, you really, when you work in change management, or if you're an entrepreneur, one of the, one of the dirty little secrets that between high growth situations and trouble company situations is they're precisely the same. Because if you have a trouble company, you have a company used to do 100 million in revenue, now it's doing 60 million in revenue, and you grow back to 80 or 90, well, that's high growth, right? And, and the commonality is both situations are chaos rather than order. Systems have fallen apart, um, culture is a mess, um, you don't have an orderly, functional organization, you have a bunch of chaos, okay? So it's very much the same. And when you're ever you're in that situation, you need to, as a leader, to be able to define for yourself what success means. Because the whole world that's paying attention to well, you that's... has their own definition and it's yes. different. And therefore, you're a failure. Yeah, that's what I, and that's exactly what, how I see the situation with Twitter, that everyone for some reason thinks that they know better and they judge Elon's decisions. And yet I think he's been pretty successful in taking that direction, like you mentioned, and just moving ahead, but regardless of everything else. How could we possibly know what his definition of success is? I'm willing to bet he doesn't even know what his of success is because you, when you walk into a chaotic situation, you, by definition, do not have a firm business plan. You have a direction, which may or may not be the right direction. He did a tweet early on that, you know, I don't have to quote, but it was something to the effect of, we're going to try a lot of things and we're going to make a bunch of bonehead mistakes at Twitter. He, he told you that, right? And then we're going to fix them. We're yeah. going to try something else. And that is the process, the process. And, and if you do that, if you like make a mistake going this way, then you go that way. And that was a mistake. Like you may end up going over, you know, on the audio, instead of going straight, you're going way on a right hand turn or something. Um, but you, you, you may not end up in the same direction, but so you, you can't be too hung up on, on, on the definitions of what success is. And the one thing I can promise you is everybody else has a different definition and therefore you're a failure. And if you're any amount of success, then it generates hate and it generates <laughs> negativity. And as he said in a tweet, you know, being attacked by the left and right equally is probably a pretty yeah. good thing. Yes. Right. That means he's found his balance. So those are a couple of things and of values, um, defining your own success. And then the numbers of it, right? Um, uh, contribution. Mar I, I, I say there's a formula to make more money, and it should be in this order. Increase your margin, lower your overhead, sell more. Okay. And he immediately went for contribution margin with this $8 blue check thing. And that's yeah. increasing prices, which is the way to increase contribution margin. And next he... He cut his costs. He reduced his people from, um, well, he was running at about 20% of the people. He, he used to have 7,000 people. And then through a series yeah. of cuts and people exiting, he got down to 20, 30%. I don't know the exact numbers. What are the expense items on Twitter? The line items? Well, it's real estate and people. That's it. So you cut yeah. down the people that much. You're going to be profitable. And as he said, he's already profitable. Yeah. No, I think, again, I think that's what people, I mean, maybe because it's a political agenda that kind of got mixed into this whole story. Like it probably shadowed the true turnaround process and people expect it to be like this, but it's not immediate. Right. So we will probably watch, keep watching this process for quite some time now. But one thing I, I remember um, when, when he said that every manager in the company needs to be able to code. I think that was his message before Thanksgiving break. And I really like that. It's to me that also shows what type of culture he's, he's trying to 
install in a company. Well, it's one that's of the values probably values credibility. That I even saw right the engineering. Yeah. Yes. No, that, that's what I mean, and I really liked it. So again, I think we both can agree that at least from the day when he took over and where he's now, he's done all those steps that for some reason, many people try not to see or because again, political agenda started to maybe overpower his moves, but I do see positive change. And like you said, he's sticking to what he promised and we'll see, we'll see how it all play out eventually. I'm willing to bet it has not overpowered anything. Don't forget attention, trust the, the, <laughs> Attention side of this has been brilliant. Tremendous. Right. And that's one of his calling cards. People focus on the engineering and the design, which is obviously brilliant, but is there a better persuader in the entire world? Yeah. Right. I mean, his ability to get attention is unbelievable. And, you know, there are zero marketing people at Tesla. There's zero marketing people in any of his companies. It's him personally yeah. with the ability to generate that attention. And you do that, you gather that attention with humor and conflict, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what he does. I agree with that. Yes. The personal branding. That's yep. <laughs> a great example of personal branding. Well, thank you. I appreciate your opinion on that. It's interesting to to hear how you see that. And I will go back to the episode you released and I listen through your breakdown of Twitter story. I'm curious now. And I suggest everyone who's listening to us right now to go and do the same. That'll be quite interesting. Well, I think uh, we are at the end of our time and I like to finish my podcast with a fun question because one of the themes in my podcast is something that I am passionate about. It's traveling because I think traveling and international experiences, those are the things that truly contribute to a very fast and tremendous personal growth for everyone. So I truly believe that. So my fun question to all my guests is where would you like to go next? Where's your next travel destination and why? And again, Anna, you're going to be disappointed in me. <laughs> <laughs> I knew this was coming. And I was thinking to myself this morning, I wonder I wonder why I would just rather sit on the couch. <laughs> and, uh, and so I reached out to my assistant, and, and the answer is, I have spent just over 125 nights in a hotel room this year. So far, so about a third of my life, I spend in a hotel room uh, in different cities. I've done, I, I've beat my hundred thousand miles uh, that I typically do without any cross uh, sea, cross ocean trips this year. And so I'm always on a plane. And I have a a nine year old daughter, daughter, and since the day she was born, my rule rule to myself was that I would be at home fifty percent of my time. Right. So I would just be in a home office, in a home studio. Um, but she would have access to me to come down and say hello, or we could hang out together or whatever it is. It doesn't matter. But I would not be away 50% of the time. So if you take that, plus this already traveling, staying in over 125 <laughs> nights in a hotel room this year, I don't, I don't, I don't want to go anywhere. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> and would I love to take three weeks off and go hang out in uh, the Dolomites in Italy? Yeah, sure. I would do that. I would do it. But I'm not going to do it. So why would I <laughs> Why would I say that's a stated goal? That Just like, you know, when you've had a couple of drinks and you're dreaming about something, that might be something that I might dream about. But the reality is I value being in my small community where I am right now in my remote house where I am right now and just being stable for a little while. Thank you, Scott. I really appreciate that was it. Disappointing, wasn't it? Not at all. Not at all. I think <laughs> I think you've done your fair share of traveling and closing deals in twenty in twenty seven countries. I, I'm pretty sure that covers the point of very consistent 
professional and personal growth through traveling and exploring different cultures you know, and that, different people's the connections. That might be part of it. I might be at the stage of my life with the experience that I have. Like I don't have a burning need and curiosity. Um, maybe that's part of it as well. Although there's many places that I've never been and mm -hmm. more about. I always enjoy it. I've always been great. I rarely have I traveled for non-business, but I've always been great at taking time out to enjoy myself when I'm in a different place. And so that helps. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that I appreciate in my work as well. When you travel for work, but you can still spend a few days and take your time to explore the place. I think it's also, it, it does contribute to, to that traveling time and exploration work part. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for this interview. Thanks for being a guest on my podcast. Congratulations. And it's been great. Thank you. Thank you.